please have Romans chapter 11 open, just those last few verses, as we spend a few minutes looking at them together. Page 1190. I'm going to start with a quote. I wonder if anyone recognizes who's writing it. Man never achieves a clear knowledge of himself unless he has first looked upon God's face and then descends from contemplating him to scrutinize himself. Any ideas? He didn't write it in English, that's a clue. John Calvin. John Calvin, exactly, Graham. Probably the greatest thinker of the Reformation. And I realize that this weekend is not the closest weekend, but next weekend we're going to be away. Uh, generally, the, the end of, of October is remembered as the time uh, whenever the Reformation took, took hold going back to 1517 and Martin Luther nailing those theses to the door in Wittenberg. And what Calvin is saying here really is, if you don't know God, you can't actually know yourself. God is the great reality. Yet from how many areas of life have people tried to remove God today? In America, the dollar bills say still say, in God we trust. But they're not allowed to have public prayer in their state schools. In this country, we proclaim our religious freedom. But how often have you heard God's name on a news bulletin? Kate Forbes was nearly not allowed to run for leadership of the Scottish National Party because she's a Christian. Although she said at the time, if some people are beyond the pale, meaning herself, meaning being ruled out before she even started, then these are dark and dangerous days for Scotland. The things that happen in our world, accidents, diseases, discoveries, achievements, are often described as if God didn't exist. But to leave God out is like adding up a sum and ignoring the biggest number. You're never going to get the right answer. And this displacing of God can even be found in the church. I was listening to a sermon by Martin Lloyd-Jones the other day. Now, obviously, he was talking about life in the 60s. And he was reacting to a statement by an Anglican churchman. And the Anglican churchman had said... And I quote because Lloyd-Jones was quoting it from a, an article. The way of approach from the Christian to the secular world is the way not of proclamation, but of dialogue. So basically what this Anglican churchman was saying was listen to unbelievers and what they have to say. And yes, there's a sense in which we, we do need to do that. But he was also saying... Don't be so keen to tell them what God has to say. Well, those verses at the very end of Romans chapter 11 give God his proper place at the centre of everything. Nothing happens without him. As Paul pours out praise for God, he's telling us there's no one like him. His judgments, as it says in verse 33, are unsearchable. In other words, unfathomable. You can't get to the bottom of them. His paths are untraceable, like paths through the midst of the sea. His mind is incomprehensible to us, to us tiny beings. Look at verse 34. Who has known the mind of the Lord? It's a kind of rhetorical question. I'll just pause for a minute to let Florence get in. Okay. 
get you get an extra mark I for just initiative. Got one, a seven. I was ready. And we, hi, where are you? I'm sleeping. I am Valley. Say. We're at the very end of Romans 11, Florence. It's just the, the last the four verses at the end that we're looking at. So we've just started on that. The last chapter? Mm -hmm. Romans right. chapter 11. 11. The last few verses. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we've just kind of taken a, a, a quick look through them, first of all, before we, we concentrate on a couple of things. Okay. Uh, so it says in verse 34, Who has known the mind of the Lord? God's mind is far bigger than we can take in. It's Isaiah who actually asks that question. And in, in verse 35, that's actually coming from Job. So Paul is quoting from a couple of places in the Old Testament. Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? God's grace, God's gifts are unrepayable. If God were to charge for salvation, what would be a good price? Do you see how the passage works? If you look back to verse 33, it says in the NIV, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. As if there's really just the two things, wisdom and knowledge. In the ESV, I think it's a better translation, Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. Three things. Riches, wisdom, knowledge. Because it seems in verses 34 and 35 that Paul is responding to each one of those in reverse order. He takes knowledge first. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Then he takes wisdom. Or who has been his counsellor? And then in verse 35 he's talking about riches. Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? So I think that's why it's a, it's a better translation Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. And there's a three-point sermon in there too, which I'm not going to preach today. But I think maybe sometimes just to, to look at those things for a minute. Knowledge. We can't know God unless God chooses to reveal himself to us. Our minds are actually very small. Wisdom. We often think God could be doing things better in our lives or in the world. But what qualifies us to be God's counsellors? Or wealth? What wealth, what riches do we have that we could help God out? God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. We are the creatures of a day. So Paul is saying here over and over in different ways, bringing in quotations from the Old Testament, God is great, far greater than we can ever conceive. We are not great. And if that's all you remember from our study today, even that's helpful. Because that's something we need to remember day by day. How unsearchable God's judgments are, his paths beyond tracing out. And Paul concludes, to him be the glory forever. Amen. And that word glory has many signs. It involves ideas of weight. If you have a weighty problem, you can't just blow it away. God is weighty. He needs to be taken seriously. There's also an idea of worth in glory. God gives everything its value. He is of supreme worth. Without him, everything would just be finite. And there are also ideas of splendor and of searing purity in glory. Because any time anyone in the Bible sees something of God's glory, think of Isaiah in the temple. They're not saying, wow. They're saying, whoa, to me. Because I'm not like this. These things come from God. He is glorious. And he wants us to recognize that. To give him alone praise, honor, and humility. Not because God is vain. 
but because giving someone else the honour that God deserves is simply wrong. There's one God who wants all from us. And God is keeping us around in the world really for that one reason, as the Westminster Shorter Catechism would tell us, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Because if you're not yet believing in him, through Jesus his Son, if you haven't yet trusted your life to him, then what are you living for? If you're not living for God, what are you living for? Why are you around? Anything beyond yourself. And today I want to just concentrate really on the final verse that Paul's leading up to that speaks about glory. For from him and through him and to him are all things. You just want to think about what that means. What kind of God is this? <clears throat> this is not just a God we bring in when science lets us down. This is a God, the one true God in charge of all things. So any area you can think of is covered by this. He's the God of nuclear physics. He's the God of astronomy. He's the God of the polar ice cap. You may be pleased to know we're going to bypass those subjects. But God does deserve praise for controlling them. The whole world does speak of him. That's why we were singing Psalm 148 to start with. But I want to look at three particular areas, and you can probably work these out quite easily yourselves. Three areas where we should give glory to God alone. And that's the title for the sermon today, Glory to God alone. And the question for you is, are you giving glory to God in these areas? The first area we look at is this. God deserves glory for his creation. God deserves glory for his creation. The Bible, God's own word, establishes this theme from the very first sentence. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In other words, God was here before the beginning. And all that now exists has come from him. <coughs> Towards the end of the 19th century, a clever man called Herbert Spencer, he was clever in a number of different disciplines. But I think if you study his life a little, he also seemed quite sad in other ways. This man, Herbert Spencer, tried to describe all reality or to, to put it into different categories. He said all that exists in the universe can be put into one of five categories. Time, force, action, space, and matter. And everything that you think of fits into one of those categories. Time, force, action, space, matter. I set that beside Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, that's time. God, that's force, a personal force. Created, that's action. The heavens, that's space. And the earth, that's matter. In the first verse of the Bible, obviously written thousands of years ago, God has already told us what man didn't work out until the 19th century. The created world, if you want to put it this way, in line with verse 36, the created world is from God. I've changed my tie today. I don't normally wear this tie these days. It doesn't really match anything else, but never mind. What's on it? Both of your shoes. Not the not the words. What's the what are the pictures? What are the dinosaurs? The dinosaurs. Those are the dinosaurs weren't actually as brightly coloured as that. I think that's an artist's impression. Uh, probably just to sell the tie. And it does say on it, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind. 
Dinosaurs are often stolen to serve the false theory of evolution. The truth is the dinosaurs, as the Thai says, come from God. God made the dinosaurs by an act of special creation. They didn't evolve over millions of years. They didn't appear by chance. And in the beginning, they only ate plants. It wasn't until after sin and death came in that they began to eat each other. And some people try to pretend that science is at war with the Bible. But when we try to understand science in light of the Bible, in light of the one who invented science, the war melts away. The whole created order is from God, and it's also through God. You see, God didn't need any material to create the universe. He made it out of nothing. He spoke the word, and the light, the water, the land suddenly appeared. The word was and is Jesus. God made the world through God. We had some unexpected visitors last Lord's Day evening. Two women and one man. And the man, James, said his favourite verse was John 1 verse 14 about the Word, the one through whom God made the world, actually taking on a human body, becoming flesh, and coming to live in this world that he made. This is God's story. This is God's truth. And the most important aspect comes next. For from him and through him and to him, the creation is also to God. In other words, the creation is for God's glory. And that's what's so distasteful about evolution, because it robs God of his glory in creation. Nor is this world for man's glory, for man to use or to abuse just as he pleases. Man is not the supreme being here. God is. Everything in the world is to bring him praise. And that's why in some of the Psalms, just again as we were singing in Psalm 148, there's a number of creation Psalms, the sun, the moon and the stars, the oceans, the mountains, the snow, the clouds, all creatures, all nations are called on to bring God praise because he made them all. He made us. He controls us. We exist for him, not vice versa. We're here to obey God's commands. And just a word about God's control of his world before we move on. God didn't just start the world going and then leave it to run on its own like some giant watch. He actively keeps the universe going every second it exists for his glory. And just to, to challenge you on that, whenever you're reading in God's word, just notice, especially in the Psalms, notice how many times we're told how God does specific things individual things. He's not some kind of absentee landlord. He is actively involved in sustaining the world he made. He keeps your life going. Mine too. You'll notice that verse 35, if you have footnotes, verse 35 is a quote from the Old Testament. As I say, it's, it's a quote from the book of Job. Who has ever given to God that God should repay him. You remember Job has been struggling to understand why all this suffering has come on him. Family tragedy, serious illness, his own wife mocking him. And then towards the end of Job, God simply steps in and starts to question Job. Many times in these chapters, 38, 39, 40, 41, many times God reminds Job of his intimate care, providing food for the raven, commanding the eagle to soar. 
You see, nothing happens to us by chance. That doesn't mean pain doesn't hurt. God doesn't give us all the answers. He doesn't give Job an answer specifically for his suffering. But God being in control means pain won't have the last word. God's gift of eternal life has been won for us through God's own pain. Could I make a plea here? Let us be convinced creationists. Even as we watch at this time of the year, the trees giving up their leaves in order that they might go on living. As we would consider the marvels of the bodies God has given us or of the universe where he has placed us. Let's not believe any theories of time plus chance. Let's give God all the glory for his creation. Let's examine the world, looking for God's fingerprints. When the snow comes, as it may this winter, don't just complain about the cold. We can all do that. Marvel that every one of those snowflakes, things of just a few minutes, everyone's different from the others, just like us, beautifully formed by our Creator. God deserves glory for his creation. Let's turn to another area. God deserves glory for his salvation. God deserves glory for his salvation. Salvation, saving people from their sins, from our sins. Salvation is from God. And that's really what Paul has been saying in many ways and many times in this letter to the Romans. He planned it all before the world began. If you have been saved from your sins, then that is the work of God. The sovereign of the universe has touched your life. And God has given us this special book, which tells us all we need to know to be saved, which tells us how to live in this world and forever. God lifts dead people and rebellious people, Romans 5 tells us, his enemies out of our sins and brings us to himself. We deserve God's wrath. We deserve God's curse for spoiling his world, but he pours out his grace instead. And it happens by faith in God alone, not because of some pile of money we've given or some great work that we've done. And it's not faith that we work up ourselves. It's faith that he gives us. We bring nothing in our hands except our sins. There's no room for boasting, as Paul says several times in Romans. And yet if you are saved, you want to boast about Jesus. You want to do good for him. On a Thursday evening, for quite some time, we've been working through Genesis. I think we started about Genesis 12, and we've got right to the end. Could I just take you back there for a moment, right back to Genesis chapter 12, just to show you how this actually works. We do know this, but I think sometimes we do need to be reminded. Page 67 in the, the NIV, Genesis 12. In the opening verses, we have this very dramatic call. God calls Abram to himself, which is quite remarkable. Abram is a heathen man, worshipping false gods. Yet God turns his life around. God gives him these breathtaking promises in verses 2 and 3 of Genesis 12. And Abram acts on the promises. But if you read the second half, of the chapter, you'll see what I mean. Abram doesn't believe here when he goes down to Egypt with Sarah. He doesn't believe that God is going to protect him. God has promised he will. I remember when we looked at this passage, we were quite short with Abram's bad behavior, actually using Sarai, his wife, as a shield. 
the kind of thing people in the Middle East have done more than once. Till God has to step in, in verse 17, and rescue him. Now, thankfully, by the, by the time we get to chapter 13, verse 4, Abram is back where he's supposed to be. He's calling on the name of the Lord. God doesn't wash his hands of his flawed and faithless servant. He rescues him and he perseveres with him for many chapters to the end of his life, as he does with every believer. Because what's true of Abram here is true of every other believer you can name in the Bible. Salvation is from the Lord, truly. Let's come back now to, to Romans 11 again. Salvation is from God and salvation is through God. It is by Christ alone. It's not Christ plus any other human mediator or Christ plus some effort from us. Just read the last couple of chapters of any of the gospel accounts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And what will strike you in those chapters is how alone Jesus is. His own disciples can't even stay awake one hour to pray with him, to pray for him. Neither as God alone could Jesus feel death, nor as man alone could he overcome death. So he brought a human and a divine nature together, the God-man, in order both to pay for sin and to win victory for us over sin. God doesn't save his people through any third party. When Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's God, forsaken by God. That he's talking about. That's the price of salvation. The righteousness, the holy purity we receive by faith alone, it comes entirely from outside ourselves. It's through Jesus, God alone. Now, man was involved. Judas betrayed Jesus. Caiaphas tried him. Pilate declared him innocent three times and then condemned him. But this is how the believers in Jerusalem praise God for it. And Eugene and I were looking at these verses just the other week. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. So that's all the human activity there was. They even enemies banding together against Jesus. But they did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Out of that most horrible evil, a dreadful miscarriage of justice, God brought eternal good. Jesus took the punishment his people deserved so that he could rescue us, so that he could rescue every believer. If God can bring good out of the cross, there's nothing he can't use to bring him glory. Your marriage, your work, your friendships, even your illnesses, your hard times, your failures, can bring glory to God. If you see them through the lens of faith, so salvation is from God, it is through God, and it is to give him the glory. When we hear of someone just saved from their sins, we congratulate that person. But we don't praise him or her saying, well, that's really good of you. You worked it all out on your own, top marks. No, surely we say praise God. Only he can save any sinner. And that indeed is the background to these verses in Romans 11. Paul has been examining God's plan of salvation in Romans 9 and 10 and 11. 
in depth with emotion. God doesn't save people because he has our personal happiness in mind. He saves people so he may receive glory. Now that sounds very self-centered. God saves people so he may receive glory. For anybody else, that would be self-centered. But for God not to seek his own glory would mean that there's somebody else in the universe more deserving than he is. For God not to seek his own glory would mean him ceasing to be God. Will you give God glory for saving you, for saving others you know? Do you really believe what Paul says over and over in Romans, that people are in mortal danger unless God steps into their lives? Is that how you pray? Believer, your job simply is to be faithful to what God's word says. You don't have to make anything up yourself to encourage people to believe all that Jesus is, all that Jesus has done, not to add anything else, not to remove the hard bits, mind you. You and I, we can't save anybody, but God can save anybody. And he can use you if you're serving him. You, you need to speak of what the, the letter to Romans concentrates on. People's deadness in sin. God's anger against sin. Death, the wages of sin. And hell coming. But you must speak too what Paul does speak a lot of in Romans. Of grace and mercy and forgiveness and love. God will soften the hearts of those he has appointed to be saved. So God deserves glory for his creation. God deserves glory for his salvation. And finally, a wee bit more tricky, God deserves glory for his judgment. God deserves glory for his judgment. And we were talking about this just the other day in college. Very first psalm. You wouldn't expect it to be talking about judgment, but already in verses 5 and 6, it's like a picture of all of life, Psalm 1, and already the, the psalmist, we don't know who wrote it, it could have been David, we're not sure, is bringing the, the reader to God's throne in judgment, and he's saying the wicked will not even stand in the judgment. We're just trying to work out what does that mean? Does it mean their knees are wobbly because they're so nervous? Does it mean the ground's slippery? Is there some other reason? But it's a very forceful picture. The wicked will not even stand in the judgment. Look at verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. It would be good to think Certainly I would want to think that all in this room are going to heaven. It would be much more difficult, I think, to conceive that all in this city are going to heaven. No one spoke more fervently, more frequently about hell than Jesus. God does save some, but he passes over others. That's what Romans 9 is telling us. If people are not saved, they are personally responsible. That's what Romans 10 is telling us. And that may not be popular, but that's what the Bible says. God is not embarrassed by hell. In fact, just take a look at one other passage. Take a look at Revelation chapter 19. Just the first few verses. Revelation chapter 19, page 1299. John says, After this I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. So far so good. For true and just are his judgments. 
He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And again they shouted, Hallelujah, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who was seated on the throne. And they cried, Amen. Hallelujah. There is rejoicing in heaven. God is receiving praise and glory because he has condemned those who stand against him. Judgment is from God. And this lets us see that evil will be punished ultimately. Not always immediately, but ultimately. After the first week of creation, God stood back and judged what he had made and said, it's very good. As his only son bowed in the river Jordan, the pure one in a line of sinners, the father spoke out, you are my beloved son. You fill me with delight. With you I'm well pleased. Would God say the same of your life if he judged your life, of my life? Judgment fell on God the day the sun refused to shine at noon. An eternity of judgment against every sin of everyone who will believe was burned up in a finite space. Judgment is through God. He has set a day when he will judge the world by this one he has appointed, the one he raised to everlasting life. Have you been united to him in his death and in his resurrection? He was judged, so you may be blessed. And judgment is to glorify God. In the book of Isaiah, God declares, I will not give my glory to another. If people will not glorify God in Christ's judgment, accepting that judgment on our behalf, then God must glorify himself in their judgment. Let me just repeat that. If people will not glorify God in Christ's judgment, accepting, understanding that Christ was judged on our behalf, then God must glorify himself in the judgment of those people. If we have died with Christ, if our sins have been dealt with through his judgment, then we will also live with him. In seeking God's glory alone, we become who God means us to be. And God is generous in all he does. He chooses us, he calls us, he forgives us, he fills us. And he intends us for glory. The sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory, the splendor that will be revealed in us. Hard to believe, but that's what the book of Romans says. Our main purpose is to glorify God in all we do and say. And in God's economy, that will rebound on our own heads in more joy than we can fully take in. At a fashionable dinner party a number of decades ago, a man called C.E.M. Jude was present. And if you have ever heard of this program, the Brains Trust, a radio program of the day, he was one of those who would have appeared on that program from time to time. He had previously been an atheist. And at this dinner party, a rather posh lady asked him, Professor Jude, what do you think of God? Madam, Jude replied, because he had tentatively become a believer in Jesus. It is rather the consuming passion of my life. 
What does God think of me? May that be the consuming passion of your life too. May you seek to give all the glory and the praise and the honour to this unfathomable and incomparable one. Because he alone is worthy. Let's talk to him in prayer. Let's stand as we pray. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honour and glory and power for ever and ever. Father, you, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, you are to be praised for all you've done, for all you're doing and for all that you will do. Help us to trace your fingerprints in this world. Help us to see your hand of grace in our lives. Help us to want you to be known far and wide for all your power and love and judgment. And Father, we can't grasp it all. As Paul quite rightly says, it is unfathomable. We can't measure the bottom of it. You are far beyond us. But we do pray that you would help us just to seek to be true to your word. Lord, we do want to pray for any who are not giving you glory as they should be. We do pray that you would show them the sin of worshipping themselves. Show them the glory of Jesus in coming down so far and in rising so high so that we may be saved. Help them to confess their sin, to believe only in him, to be saved and to be changed. And Father, help us all to know in our lives from day to day, help us all to know that Jesus has a soft spot for sinners. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And we'll close our service by singing part of Psalm 96a. Psalm 96a, singing stanzas 1 and 2, and then stanzas 7 to 10. It's on page 224. And we're going to sing to the tune Converse, number 257. And at the beginning, we have been encouraging, uh, trying to encourage you to give God glory for creation. It says at the beginning, Come sing to the Lord a new song, all the earth sing to the Lord. To the Lord sing, praise his name, his saving grace each day record. Praise God for creation, praise him for salvation. And then the way that the psalm closes, we're actually praising God for judgment as well. Because it does say God will judge the peoples in stanza 7. All with equity, with fairness, with justice. All wrongs will be righted. And that is a reason to praise God. As stanza 10 tells us, he will judge the world in righteousness. In other words, he will judge the world through Jesus. So if we are his then we have nothing to fear, even in the judgment. We can praise God even for that. So Psalm 96a stands as 1 and 2 and 7 to 10. Let's just do that. Let's praise God. <clears throat> Come sing to the Lord a new song. All the earth sing to the Lord. To the Lord sing praise his name. Each day record, tell his glory to all nations, his great works to peoples all. For the Lord is great, praise worthy to be feared above all gods. Say to nations, O oh, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is steadfastly fixed from moving, he will judge the people.
rose all with equity. Let the heavens be glad and bless them, and rejoice the seed in sight. With all in it, let the fields be joyful with what's in them find. And throughout all of the forest, sing for joy with all the trees. Sing before the Lord rejoicing. Coming is for he comes to sit in judgment of the earth and judge will be all the world in righteousness and all its folk most faithfully. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.